So we just finished looking at the Ten Commandments that God had given Moses and all the Israelites. Uh, again, these commandments could not make the people righteous, but they accomplished two main things. First of all, they reveal the uh, fact that God is perfect and he is holy and he is righteous. And it also reveals the fact that human beings are far from holy and righteous. In fact, we are very unrighteous. But at the same time, this is God's moral code for humanity. And even when we fail to, to keep God's laws, but we try to keep God's laws, society is better for it. Now, that doesn't save anybody, but society is better for it. This is God's moral code. However, the Old Testament saints who were declared righteous by God were not saved because they tried their hardest to keep the law, but they were declared righteous because they believed God's word and they place their faith and trust in the Lord. It's, a person is only saved by faith in the Lord, in his word and in the Lord. And even the father of faith, Abraham, was saved not because of any good works that he did, but simply because he believed the Lord. He put his faith and trust in God, period. Genesis 15, verse 6, it says of Abraham, and he believed in the Lord, and he, the Lord, accounted it to him for righteousness. Uh, the Apostle Paul explains it this way in Romans chapter 4, uh, starting in verse 2. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. And the Bible is very clear that God will not be in debt to anyone. And so how is anyone saved today? Again, by faith alone, in Christ alone. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 clearly says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so throughout the Old Testament, we see God revealing his nature, his character to his people. And the primary way that he does is through the word of God, very clearly. And God's desire for his people was that they would believe his word and trust that he loved them and realize that he would always be with them, and realize that he would never forsake them, and he would protect them, and he would provide for them. And at times, the Israelites did believe the Lord. They did trust him. They believed his word, but unfortunately, they would go through seasons when they did not walk by faith, and they did not hold fast to the promises of his word, and they would rebel. And like we saw in Judges, they did right what was right in their own eyes, even though in the eyes of God, it says the people did what was evil in the Lord's eyes. But the Jewish people of old were no different than Christians today. I mean, we've all gone through seasons where we have done what is right in our own eyes. We've all done things that we're not, you know, I'm proud of. Uh, we've all done things that have not um, been pleasing to the Lord. We've all done things that, you know, where we did not hold fast to God's word. But again, the Apostle Paul reminds us that we need to learn from our mistakes and learn from the mistakes of the Old Testament uh, Israelites um, in Romans or in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, it's referring to their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, and it talks about how God had blessed them. He gave them water from the rock. The rock was Christ, how he gave them manna from heaven. And it goes through all these things that God did in the wilderness with the Israelites. And then it also talks about how the Lord was displeased with them, and he struck the first generation down in the wilderness because of their rebellion against God. And so, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6 Speaking of these events, Paul writes, Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they, speaking of the Israelites, also lusted. Uh, again, keep that in mind as we go through the, the rest of the book of Exodus. And don't forget, God was dealing with two and a half to three million new believers. And they've only known the Lord for about... 15 months at this point in our study, 
Ever since God started uh, speaking to Moses from the burning bush, which led to the ten plagues in Egypt, which has brought them out of slavery in Egypt. And for the last three months, God has been providing for them water from the rock, manna from heaven. He has been blessing them in so many ways. And so now, after God has just given Moses and the Israelites the Ten Commandments, we pick up in chapter 20, verse 18. So let's read from here. <clears throat> it says, Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, You speak with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Now, there was this lady that I heard about who was the unofficial church gossip. Uh, she had appointed herself the moral policeman of the church, and she was in the habit of calling out people's sins and failures and even spreading a few rumors. And she went to the store one day and noticed that Fred's old beat-up pickup truck was parked outside the liquor store at this mall. And um, Fred was a brother from the church. And so she quickly assumed that Fred had started drinking again, that he'd fallen off the wagon. He's backsliding into his old ways. But the truth was, Fred parked his beat-up old pickup truck there because it was the only place to park. And he was actually inside the uh, hardware store next door to the liquor store. So the next Sunday morning, she was standing with a group of people in the church and she's saying, oh, we need to pray for Fred. You know, he is backslidden. He fought, fell off the wagon. I saw his old beat-up pickup truck in front of the liquor store. He's back to his old sinful ways. Now, Fred was nearby, and he hears the whole thing. Now, he doesn't say anything, but he is just upset because she's spreading false rumors. But he was quiet about it, so that night, Fred parked his beat-up old pickup truck right in front of her house and left it there till the next morning. I'm pretty sure that would have shaken her up and shut her mouth. In a way, that is what God is doing with the Israelites here. Remember, they've been grumbling and complaining against Moses. Why did you bring us out here? Weren't there enough graves in Egypt? You know, at least we had food and water in Egypt. So God, who has done one miracle after another, stops their grumbling and complaining by coming down to Mount Sinai. Uh, this is the third time this mentions. He came down with thunder and lightning. We saw that he came with the sound of a loud trumpet, fire and smoke. We saw that the whole mountain was shaking and trembling. And as God is giving them the Ten Commandments, God is defining what his standard for righteousness is and showing the people the reality that we are all sinners. And as both Psalm 14 in the Old Testament and Romans 3 in the New Testament declares, there is none righteous, no, not one. And so... We will be reminded that we need to pay attention to our hearts. We need to live by the truths of God's word, and his word has not changed. And if you want a healthy relationship with God, then you and I, we need to live according to the truth of God's word. Now, the great advantage that we have today as followers of Jesus Christ, we have two great advantages. One, we have the completed word of God. The Israelites didn't have anything written down yet. And we also have the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. What a huge advantage. I mean, he brings conviction into our hearts. You know, he shows us when we're messing up. You know, he's the one who empowers us to live out our Christian lives in victory over the world and over the flesh and over the lies of the enemy. So look at verse 18 once again. We'll break this down. It says, now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. 
And so, again, the people trembled. They're standing, they're backing away from the mountain as God is revealing himself to Moses through the Ten Commandments. And as the Lord Almighty was upon Mount Sinai, uh, again, what a tremendous sight this must have been. I mean, we can't imagine. Cecil B. DeMille could not capture this on film. I mean, this must have been so glorious to behold God himself coming upon the mountain in this dark cloud and just everything shaking and, you know, just the, the sounds of the, the, you know, lightning and thunder and just the mountain quaking. But their response, notice that, the response is the proper response while in the presence of a holy God as he reveals his nature and character, as he speaks his word. Now, God has spoken many times in the Bible already in Genesis and so far in Exodus. He's spoken many times, but this is really his, you might say, first sermon when he gives the Ten Commandments. And the people are pierced in their hearts as the Lord identifies and calls out sin. Now, do you know what Jesus said when he gave his first sermon? Uh, it was after the wilderness wandering or 40 days in the wilderness after his temptation uh, he gets victory over satan's temptations and then it says this matthew 4 17 from that time jesus began to preach and to say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand his first words to the public were repent that means turn from your sin and turn to the lord very simple, very clear, repent. What a difference we're seeing in churches today. They want to make everybody feel comfortable. They want people to feel good about their lives, no matter how they're living contrary to the Lord. And so there's a lot of churches, unfortunately, they don't talk about sin. They don't talk about repentance. That's usually because they don't teach God's word. But you go through the word of God and you'll see it over and over again. God wants us to turn from sin and turn to him. That is full repentance, not just stop doing bad, but turn to the Lord, surrender your life to the Lord. But often today we just see, you know, canned sermonettes for carnal Christianettes. They often emphasize people's felt needs and getting the most out of your life today, your human potential. But when you go through God's word, he has everything we need for life and godly living. He has everything we need to encourage us and comfort us. His word has everything we need to also exhort us and challenge us and expose and correct us. But it will always point us to Jesus Christ, the one who loves us, the one who is molding us, the one who is shaping us more and more into his image and likeness. But when you come face to face with God Almighty, I guarantee there will be fear and trembling that is a normal reaction. Remember when Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 5. Here's his response. So I said, this is Isaiah. Woe is me for I am undone. That means I'm destroyed. Because I am a man of unclean lips. Here's the prophet Isaiah. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Again, that's the reaction when you're standing in front of a holy God, the one who's perfect in every way. You're not going to be saying, well, I measure up pretty good. And you'll never say that. When the glorified Jesus revealed himself to the apostle John on the island of Patmos, John's response is recorded in Revelation 1.17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he's laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. You know, when Jesus was calling Peter and Andrew and James and John, the four fishermen, it was after they fished all night long and they caught nothing. So Jesus gets into Peter's boat and he tells them, Okay, push out a little bit into deep water. And Peter's basic reaction was, Oh, come on, Lord, we've been fishing all night long and caught nothing. But then he says, Okay, nevertheless, at your word, we'll do it. And instantly it says their net was full of fish. It was so full, they bring in another boat, and both boats nearly sink because there's so many fish in it. And it's in Luke 5, verse 8. Here's Peter's reaction. 
When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And so here in Exodus, we have about two and a half to three million Israelites saying basically the same thing after God appears on the mountain and just the awesomeness of God's presence there. We're dead. We're toast. You know, we can't do this. We can't handle this. God is too awesome. So again, look at verse 19. They said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. Again, the people are just terrified, but in a sense, that is exactly what God wanted. The Israelites are realizing just how holy, how righteous, how awesome God is, and they also are realizing just how far they fall short of the glory of God. They knew from what they're seeing and also from what God is saying that He is perfect, and they are not. And so, in their fear, in their dread, they don't want the Lord speaking to them anymore. They, 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 they're basically saying, we've heard the Ten Commandments, that's enough. And so now they beg Moses to stand between them and God. In other words, Moses would become the mediator. And that's an innate desire for a mediator that every person has. Everybody, I think that's within everyone. There, there's that innate desire. We need a mediator. We need someone to stand between a holy God and a sinful human being like me. In the oldest book of the Bible, the book of Job, written around the time of the patriarch, around Abraham's time, he even understood the need for a mediator, one who would stand in his place before a holy God. Job says of this mediator, one who may lay his hand on both of us, one who would stand in that gap. Now, the only legitimate mediator who could bridge the gap between holy God and sinful man must be both God and man. And uh, there's only one who qualifies, and that's why we celebrate this time of year. The, the incarnation, or God himself, becomes human. He takes on human flesh, born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, even as Micah 5, 2 would say, where he would be born. And that's he's the only one who is God come in human flesh. And as the Son of Man, Jesus alone was perfect in all of his ways, he alone fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, he's the only one that could. He alone stands in the gap between God and us. Look at these verses, 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6. It says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Now, unfortunately, some people are aware of their need for a mediator, someone to stand in that gap, but unfortunately, they look to someone else or they look to something else to try to bridge that gap, like religion. Oh, if I'm just religious, that will get me into the presence of God. Or their bank account. Oh, you know, I'll just give a lot of money to a lot of good deeds, you know, a lot of good charities, and then God will let me in. That, that's not a good mediator. Jesus is the only way to be connected to holy God. Jesus himself says in uh, John 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, unfortunately, the fear that the Israelites experienced at this moment it did not last very long because within 40 days of this event, they would have Aaron make them a golden calf and they would dance around this golden calf and they would worship this golden calf and they would cry out, this is our God who delivered us from Egypt. Not a good thing. And so even though the fear of the Lord is important, our ultimate motivation for living for God and serving God must be love, not fear. 
but it has to be love, God's love for us and our love for him. Psalm 9 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. But then check out 1 John 4, 18 and 19. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. So when it comes to obeying the Lord and living for Jesus, love is the greatest motivation there is. I mean, we shouldn't be like, oh, no, God's going to strike me if I don't do this or do that. That's not a good way to live. We should be surrendering to the Lord because we love him, because he first loved us. He gave his very life for us. God demonstrated his own love toward us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Look at verse 20. It says, And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Now, Moses wants the people to know it's good to have a healthy fear of the Lord, but don't be afraid of God. And there is a big difference between the two. Some people don't understand this difference, but there's a huge difference between having a healthy fear of the Lord and not being afraid of God. God is not trying to scare them off. He's not trying to discourage them. He's not trying to push them away, but he's trying to instill within them a basic reverence and awe for who he is, for all that he has done. God wants them and he wants us to have a healthy relationship with him. He wants us to love him. He wants us to obey him. He wants us to honor him for who he is. Who is he? Well, the creator of the heavens and the earth, your creator. He made you. He provides for you. He's a creator and sustainer of life. Charles Bridges gave a great definition of the fear of God. He says, The fear of the Lord is an affectionate reverence of a child that bends to his father's authority. Listen to that again. The fear of the Lord is an affectionate reverence of a child that bends to his father's authority. For those of you who have or had a loving and gracious and strong father, you know how much easier it is or was to listen and obey him. And to a much greater degree, that's how it should be with our Heavenly Father. So that's what God is going to do with the Israelites. He's letting them know He alone is God. There's no other gods. He's already made that very clear with the first commandment. And if you do things God's way, you'll experience joy, you'll experience peace, you'll experience His blessings. But if you don't, if you rebel against God, things are not going to go so well for your life. And so even though God is huge and awesome and omnipotent, He does not want us to be afraid of Him. Don't be afraid of God. But He wants us to turn to Him. He wants us to trust that His ways are best. Now again, in verse 21, we see Moses in the role of a mediator between God and the people of Israel. But notice that phrase, But Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. <clears throat> Interesting phrase. Isn't God light? Absolutely. God is light. The Bible is very clear about that. The Bible says that God dwells in unapproachable light. But it's also true that God will also come to us when we are in a very dark place, when we're in a dark place in our own lives, when it seems like the walls of this world are closing in all around us, God is there. Matthew 1.23, it's a quote from Isaiah 7.14. It says of the birth of Jesus, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Never forget, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are with you. King David gave us great insights to this when he writes in Psalm 139, verses 7 to 12, David says, Where can I go from your, uh, your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. 
If I make my bed in hell, or Sheol, the place of the grave, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. And the Bible's clear that Jesus is at the right hand of God. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. Notice the darkness and the light are both alike to you. In other words, you might think, I'm lost in the dark. God has lost me in the dark. But David says, no, even there, God is present. Even there, God will bring light. Even there, his right hand will be upon me. Even there, in my darkest place, God is with me. Again, the Bible is clear. God will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Now, on the other hand, you may think you can run and hide from God and that he won't see the sins you're doing. Don't be so naive. God knows all. God sees all. And God alone can set you free from those sins that are destroying your life. And he can forgive you, and he can cleanse your heart, he can renew your mind, he can restore what the enemy has devoured. And even if you find yourself in a dark place today, and even if it's no fault of your own, others have put you in that dark place, the Lord is faithful to come to you, and he brings comfort, he brings peace, he brings assurance into our hearts and minds that he is there, that he loves us, he cares for us. A great example of this is seen when Jesus tells his disciples to get in the boat. He says, go to the other side, talking about the Sea of Galilee. And so they get in the boat. They start going to the other side. They get about halfway across the Sea of Galilee, and a storm hits, and they're stuck in the middle of the Sea of Galilee for hours and hours, just fighting to stay afloat. And it says that Jesus is watching them, Mark's gospel says he's watching them from the top of the mountain. He's looking down, watching them struggle in the darkness, in the storm. But then you know what happens. He walks on water to them. And as they see him coming in the darkness and he's walking towards them, they start to freak out and they say, it's a ghost. And then Matthew 14, 27, it says, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. That means take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Now, many of us have been in dark places in our lives. Maybe the death of a loved one. Maybe a bad diagnosis, a difficult diagnosis. Maybe a spouse had cheated on you. Or a thousand and one other things. But in the darkness, that still small voice of the Lord breaks through, and Jesus says, take courage. Don't be afraid. I am here with you. I'll never leave you. I won't abandon you. Do you remember what happened when Jesus was on the cross, when he was dying for our sins? The last half, the last three hours he was on the cross, there was darkness, it says, throughout the land. Just a weird experience. And that's when Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then at the very end, he says, It is finished. That's when Jesus embraced the darkness of our sin in order to reconcile each one of us to our Heavenly Father. He embraced the darkness, the darkness of our sin, the darkness of God's wrath that was being poured out upon him when he's crying out, why have you forsaken me? That's when he alone paid the price in full. So, so the bottom line is, do not fear the darkness because Jesus is with us. Jesus very clearly says, I am the light of the world. And so even in your dark place, he will come. He will bring light. He'll bring hope. He'll encourage you. He'll restore but you have to put your faith and trust in him. So look at verse 22. <clears throat> then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen what I have talked with you. 
You've seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make anything to be with me, gods of silver or gods of gold. You shall not make for yourselves, again, the second commandment. You shall have no graven image before me. Um, verse 24, an altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you, and I will bless you. And if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone, for if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. Nor shall you go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. In other words, God wants the focus to be on him and not upon the altar. Instead of focusing on carved idols of animals that they would worship, he says, no, this altar will be a place where you sacrifice live animals for me. Instead of the works of our hands being exalted, <clears throat> God himself would be exalted. Instead of the flesh of man being puffed up, the flesh of sacrificial animals would be burned up. Idols were everywhere in Egypt. I mean, they had idols for everything. And they'll make an idol of a golden calf here in chapter 31, 32 in that area. But God is doing a new work in the wilderness with his people. No idols, no trinkets. God is spirit, as Jesus said. He must be worshipped in spirit and truth. Anytime people have idols or icons or images to remind them of God, it's usually because they've lost the consciousness of God in their hearts and in their minds. They've lost the reality of God. And so God is telling the people in verse 22, You've seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You've heard the thunder, you've seen the lightning, you've felt the trembling of the mountain, you've seen the fire, you've smelled the smoke. The reality of who I am could not be any clearer to you, and so I do not want you going through the motions of religion, but I want you to have a relationship with me. Now, this is still something we all need to be aware of today. We need to be careful not to get caught up in doing busy work for God, but we need to maintain our relationship with God. Our relationship is more important than anything we do. And Jesus brings this up in his letter to the powerful church of Ephesus. Revelation 2, starting in verse 2, Jesus tells this powerful church that was established by Apollos and built up by the apostle Paul, I know your works your labor, your patience, these are all good things, that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, <clears throat> and you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. He's commending these believers because of the hard work they were doing. They were being faithful, they're persevering, they're discerning. But here's the problem, Jesus says, nevertheless. You don't want to hear Jesus say that. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Jesus appreciates the fact that they were such hardworking people, but they have abandoned their relationship with Christ. In other words, they have fallen from being a bride, and now they are simply employees. Think of it that way. You have been, and you are, a bride, the bride of Christ. Jesus did not hire us to work for him. He bought us with his blood so that we could be in a loving relationship with him. Again, that's why he's telling this church, get back to that first love relationship with him. And that's basically what God is telling the people here in Exodus. I brought you out of Egypt because I love you. I want to have this amazing, glorious relationship with you. So don't exchange this by carving some useless idols, by building some elaborate temple, some you know massive altar. Don't do it. God just wants us to love him because he first loved us. And again, 
Nothing will motivate you to serve the Lord more than love. That's the greatest motivation there is. Verse 25, <clears throat> And if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone, for if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it, nor shall you go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. That's what the pagans did with their human sacrifices. They would take up a, you know, a, a woman, you know, naked, sacrifice her on top of their altars to their pagan gods. He goes, no, I don't want that. I, that is wickedness. That is not who I am. You will not go up this way. But you, if you make me an altar, make it out of plain dirt, stone. Again, the pagan altars were very elaborate, very ornate structures. Again, they'd have steps leading up to the top of the altar, sacrifice humans on the altar, trying to appease their gods, or they would perform wicked sexual acts on their altars to appeal to their pagan gods and goddesses. God didn't want any of that. He's saying keep the altar simple. Leave your tools at home. How can you improve on God's creation? He created the rocks. He created the dirt. You know, when you hear these secular scientists say, oh, we can imitate what God does, and then the smart ones will say, yeah, but can you make dirt? No, only God could. The main reason that God is saying this is it's not the altar that matters most, but it's the sacrifice on the altar. It's the substitutionary sacrifice on the altar that matters the most because atonement is found in the sacrifice, not with the altar. Very important. And you know, some churches have gotten carried away with all the physical trappings of making things elaborate and ornate. I remember on a, one of our uh, Israel trips years ago, I think it was the 2000 trip, <clears throat> You go to all these amazing archaeological places. You're in Capernaum. You know, you're going to Bet Shan. You're going to, you know, Caesarea by the sea. Amazing places. And then our way back, because we had a delay going over, they put us up for two nights in London. And so you go to London and you see, like, St. Paul's Cathedral. What an amazing facility. Dead as a doornail, but it's amazing. Uh, the present St. Paul's Cathedral was built in the early 1700s. It's about 300 years old now. 365-foot ceiling. I mean, that's a football field. More than a football field in height. It's a monument to man. How sad. That's all I could think of. How sad. I mean, you don't, you don't see or f sense the presence of God. How grateful I am to have grown up in the Calvary Chapel movement. Pastor Chuck's motto was, make it nice, but keep it simple. It's not an elaborate structure that's a monument to man in the future, but it should be a place where we worship the Lord. And that's what it's all about, worshiping the Lord. There's only two ornate structures that God asked the Jewish people to make. One we'll read about later in Exodus. That was the tabernacle. The other one was Solomon's temple. Why were they so ornate? Because they were models of heaven itself. We'll talk more about that when we get there. That's what was so special about the tabernacle and the temple. Specifically, everything in the tabernacle, everything in the temple pointed to Jesus Christ. And that's why it was so beautiful. But we will also see that the greatest altar... Of all time, it was just made from two pieces of wood. The cross. The cross beam. One piece of wood, two pieces of wood. Greatest altar, just plain old wood. Heavy lumber. That altar was the most important thing. But it's not more important than Jesus. Jesus is the most important not the altar, but Christ himself, the ultimate Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. Today, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. These bodies are nothing. 
You melt them down, the same 17 elements that make up common dirt are the same 17 elements that make up a human body. God made Adam from the dust of the ground, the dirt of the ground. So it's not this vessel that is important, but it's what's inside of us, Jesus dwelling in us. That's the important thing. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, But we have this treasure, speaking of Jesus, in earthen vessels, just little clay pots, that's you and me, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. That's the bottom line. It's all about Jesus. It's serving him because we love him, because he first loved us. It's using our gifts and talents for his glory, not for ourselves. You know, we need to be plugged in to the body of Christ. We need to look for opportunities to serve, not just here, but when you get out of here. That's where ministry happens more than anywhere. When you're out on the work job, in your workplace, when you're at school, wherever you might be, serving the Lord out of a pure heart simply because he loves you. And then when all is said and done, you can say like the Apostle Paul, at the end of his life, I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. I've finished the race. There's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. It's not only for me, Paul says, but for all those who have loved the Lord's appearing. 